a lot of my what I think is catalyst is to slow down to speed up and it's around um, checking my bias and checking my triggers and checking my intent before I take an action because um, going fast I've often been um, speeding up a deficit model and so having to unlearn that has been one of my hardest but probably my most valuable bit of my journey. Hi, I'm Shannon Lucas. And I'm Tracy Lovejoy. And we're the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to catalyzing innate change makers to accelerate positive change. This is our podcast, Move Fast, Fast, Break Shit, Shit, Burn Out, where we highlight catalysts that are creating amazing change in the world. In this season of the podcast, we are diving deep into the skills that make catalysts successful. And I'm thrilled today to have Helen here with me. You may be confused by Helen's accent as she joins us today from Melbourne, Australia. Also, I have to shout out where my husband's family is from. Um, A majority of her career in the UK has involved putting the human back into the center of transformations within financial services. Yes. Her move to Australia 12 years ago during the global financial crisis allowed her to broaden her transformation work with other sectors. As joint head of the IX, IBM's digital agency for Australia and New Zealand, Helen brings together a collection of renegades and realists to deliver impact. Her recent Women in Tech Leadership Award, congratulations, I forgot to say that earlier, celebrated her results with inclusive design leadership as she delivers on her purpose to increase the diversity of designers across Australia and New Zealand. Well done. Uh, Leading to greater innovation and impact. Yes. As well as being a mom, a wife, and a mentor, Helen recharges when working across social impact spaces and geeks out most when working with others on decolonized design, behavioral economics, and sustainable development goal projects. That's just a short list of what Helen does. You should see the list of all of the things that she's also doing on LinkedIn. She has her hands in a million things as cattles are wont to do. I don't know how you sleep or when you sleep. It's lovely to have you here with us today, Helen. Thank you so much. It's gorgeous to be here. Enjoy my conversation with you. Well, let's just kick it off. Uh, We'd love to start by hearing how you relate to the concept of catalyst. So it's fascinating because I think I've got two stages of my career. Um, When I first became what I think of as a catalyst, um, I was young, curious, and just like, ooh, um, help me help me see how people are doing things differently. And it was very um, fast paced. Um, So for example, I was um, involved in mergers and acquisitions and I would be going into a call center and listening into calls and taking calls and going, oh, how is it different here? And uh, almost like you do in English class, you know, the compare contrast. It's like, oh, that's new. And I, I was recharged a lot by new. And I had the ability to critique um, from a place of empathy, but Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily have the language for it in that time. Um, And then I got better at the the numbers and being able to give labels around and stories and data to to be able to to formalize my thinking. But then um, I think... That was that probably took me up to my early 30s. But then my second season, I would say, is when I have had to unlearn a lot of that. Mm. And so in the last probably 10 years, a lot of my what I think is catalyst is to slow down to speed up. And it's around um, checking my bias and checking my triggers and checking my intent before I take an action because um, going fast, I've often been um, speeding up a deficit model. Mm. And so having to unlearn that has been one of my hardest, but probably my most valuable bit of my journey. That is so fascinating. And the depth of thinking behind that is profound. And I love there, I think for a lot of catalysts, there is the first stage and a second stage. 
I love that, you know, we talk all the time about the slowing down to speed up the, because we have to also bring the people along. I love the checking the bias and the triggers and the intent. Like we can often be well-intentioned, but not even know the things that are driving that intent consciously sometimes. Speak to speeding up the deficit model. Like, I think I know what you mean by that, but I just want to make oh, sure that that's clear. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'm lucky enough to, to work with a lot of technologists right and um so amazing people that are doing phenomenal work and able to use data in ways that, that blows my mind um so um phenomenal and exciting and accelerating so many paths but if you look at examples across the world what you'll see is data just speeds up bias and mm. artificial intelligence speeds up bias so if you look in uh, the states we have examples of um, um, when we've automated police systems, um, mm. the past performance is accelerating future thinking. Um, all it does is tell you how to arrest more black people. Right, right. right. Um, and if you look at, um, um, I've got some beautiful examples that I use um, when I'm doing training around this stuff that, that's about user experience. Um, that looks at um, um, there's taps that have been designed by um, a white man and it doesn't work with black hands underneath. Interesting. Um, yeah, um, so I've got so many examples from uh, a race, uh, a gender, uh, um, just a mental model perspective that is um, going faster and automating processes for yourself not realizing how many other people you're saying no no but this is just for me let me exclude you from this capability and it's so important because you know from a design and i'd love to understand how you got into design because that's not a career that most of us started off like <laughs> i want to be that when i grew up that wasn't a thing but just as an example, I, I posted this picture on LinkedIn. It was at an airport and I just thought it was so brilliant. It had red and green lights over all the stalls of the bathroom at the airport so that you could, you didn't have to play the game. Like, is anyone in there or whatever? And I was like, so simple, so genius. And someone was like, what about colorblind people? Absolutely. Like, oh, of course, you know? And so the inclusivity that you're talking about in the design process is so important for us to get better outcomes. Yeah. And often you're not your user, right? That's right. And it, <laughs> and it's thinking about, yeah, who who is this actually for? And how can you design with them, um, not necessarily for them for because them. we're for autonomy. Yeah. 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 Um, can you give us, because I want to make sure we get to the skills thing, but can you give us like the short version of how you got into design? Yeah, interesting. So um, um, so EQ wasn't a thing, right? It, it, EQ is a, a label that, even Harvard Business Review, I've only started talking about it in the last 20 years. So um, every um, system that I've been part of um, has reinforced and validated the IQ and speed right. have been really important. So um, when I started my transformation career, um, the, the labels and the capabilities that were most important were more around Six Sigma. Yeah. And how can you quantify? How can you measure? How can you process and prove everything mm -hmm. um so it took me um coming to australia um to um work with some amazing leaders um and move into so i uh, started working for australian red cross and um nothing like understanding disasters at an australian level to help you understand where data isn't actually going to fix the problem mm. So um, usually my, um, my transformations are around helping people understand the human in the center of a process. Um, with Red Cross, that was not a problem. They deeply <laughs> understood the human situation. And my job was more about um, process and commercial maturity and trade-offs and strategy is sacrifice, right? And you can't do it all. And right. how, do you, uh, how do you make those decisions in an informed way? So I think that helped me, that tipping point helped me. But mm. um, um, I, I think it's just, there was a season um, that um, um, design thinking and um, human-led transformation started to come into the vernacular. 
and it, it the um, there's a wonderful um, artist and designer called Mo Fox um, mm-hmm. in Australia, and she she was bringing in a lot of language about complexity theories and talking about you can't fix it but you can make it better or worse which actually gave me language and tools and methodologies that were what I did right totally but um it yeah it it felt so right it felt so authentically me but I just didn't have the the labels before that so um yeah I give Mo actually quite a lot of credit of helping me on my tipping point into the how design is meant to be so for me um, um a lot of people think of design as the the aesthetics the color the um the brand end of design and yeah. a lot of my capabilities is around the the organizational transformation end of design nice. or the service design or the ecosystem design and my brain um the sweet spot that my brain works in is the the two to five year space and the mm-hmm. being able to hold multiple entities thinking models and so on in this, at the same time and be able to to play um in that space and that's um the ability to have uh high iq and high eq and play in those models is where i figured out my superpower is it's amazing and it's a great pivot to the next question but i just want to say like let's put is it mo fox we'll put it in the show notes so that people oh, yeah. can see that yeah um, so yeah, I mean, EQ is definitely a skill and can be taught. So I'm just wondering like what one or two skills have supported you in your success as a catalyst? Yeah, so I think EQ is like, it's the superpower. And um, if you watch any of um, Brady Brown's most recent work, um, so she's just done um, a book called Atlas of the Heart and she's done a TV oh. series to, to back it oh, up. Brady Brown, well. yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, she talks about empathy yeah. and the core components of EQ and uh, she unpacks it in a way that has um, blown my mind a little bit recently. Um, so I always thought my job was to have as high empathy as possible. Um, and I knew empathy as being um, a, a superpower and skill that you can learn. And it's one of the, the skills that you learn more and more as you get older. Um, and I heard about it being at three different levels. So there's intellectual empathy. So as in, oh, third world hunger, it's a thing, but it stays in my head. There's a physical empathy that is, um, oh, someone gets hurt. And you feel it, you know, we all have our things that yeah. we cringe worthy. Like, oh, yeah. that yeah. Yeah. hurt. Yeah. Um, but then the third one is a compassion and it's got a bias to action. Yes. And that that is the the empathy superpower, and it comes through stories and data. And so do you understand the problem? Can you quantify? that it's actually a problem and it's not just one person that's going through this situation, but what's the story of what it feels like? So again, um, the the more that you can hear stories to back up and augment the data, yeah, uh, that's that bit of empathy is um, the most amazing. But the, the key thing that Brené pointed out though is you can't actually walk in the other person's shoes. You can imagine yourself there, but you can't. You have never lived that experience. So I can intellectualize around third world hunger. Um, but um, because I've not grown up in that situation, my responsibility is to actually listen and believe the other person. Mm. And that's the kryptonite um that I've realized I didn't have because I feel things really deeply um I thought that was enough and actually um my biggest lesson is listen harder that is that is profound and can you give us an example like in the work world I mean I agree with everything and that's a it's a great shift for me because I do I can embody the energetic thing so deeply that you do feel and then it's like a really good reflection like you know oh no I, I can't experience color blindness so I don't know what that how that would impact them right so how has I mean the two key things that I hear you say are 
empathy sort of as a sub component of EQ is one skill. And then this like deep listening and believing is the other. Is there, is there an example in work since you've had that epiphany where that's meant, or maybe a time when you didn't have it and you wish you had had it? Yeah, I've got so many examples of when I wish I had had it. Um, I've, um, when I returned from mat leave, um, um, I think, um, I, I am, uh, I'm a rare story um about someone that got promoted during my leave um wow. so i was on um day three of maternity leave when i um interviewed for my new um senior management role and um so i came back to a job when my daughter was three and a half months old which um the even the chemicals going through your body right it's like totally well, totally it, it is, was a moment that <laughs> definitely lots of learnings and more compassion on reflection <laughs> um, but um I think for me in that season I so wanted to fit in and mm. I so didn't feel good enough that I um, moved into a place of um competition rather than compassion and um so um as one of the only females in the leadership team um i believed that um, to be successful here you need to win and um that was one of my worst times as a leader it was um when i didn't show up as my authentic self when i didn't listen to people and what they needed um, and when I moved to um, results at whatever cost. And so um, um, I get it, like it was from a place of insecurity and fear and believing that um, not only um, would I get fired if I didn't show up in this way, but having a deficit model in my head and because I uh, had worked in uh red cross i knew lots of stories about what can go wrong once you get fired mm -hmm. um, so my ability to show up and know that i was enough mm -hmm. um, was uh yeah it took me a number of years and it's still like it's a constant battle right but um yeah i i think the empathy for myself and the deep listening to myself is um, the thing that I have to keep me inject on. Yes. Yeah. And this, I mean, and the self-compassion for the system is set up in that deficit manner. It does tell you that it is a competition. They breed on fear and stack rankings. And so it's not like you brought that to you, you know, it's like, that's the system that you work in. And so then in that system, and as a woman and being earlier on your career and with all the hormones, like, I just have a lot of compassion for that person at that moment, because it's just tough, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so um, what I've learned is I can't necessarily fix it for, for me, but I can pay forward to that learning. And so um, I think there's two key lessons. One is the more people I can tell that I got promoted during that leave, the better. So thank you for this podcast and the opportunity to do that. Because although Cheryl Sandberg talks about leaning in, it's freaking hard to believe it can happen. Yeah. Um, so the more stories we hear about that and um, negotiating for pay and equality and the, the rights that we have, um, but also the how much I can help people as they're returning when I can see that they've not got their compassion on with them because they're trying so hard to fit back in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I think we do need to get that narrative out there about the choicefulness and the advocate, the self advocacy, and and in in a in a sea again of stories that tell you that that's not possible. Like that's that's what that construct is. And the other thing I love about what you talked about in sort of the deep listening, it's such a great connection. Like the empathy for self is tapping into being able to hear your authentic self and when you're out of alignment with that which I also think is a really big precursor to be able to then do the active deep listening and the compassion for others. Because if you are just in like projection mode or fighting fight or flight or whatever, you can't really, you're bringing too much baggage to that listening. Yeah. 
Absolutely agree. All right, so that was fascinating and very vulnerable. Thank you so much for sharing. And very, I, I have goosebumps. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the feels. What are some of your biggest challenges right now as a catalyst leader? And I'll add the additional perspective potentially for our listeners of, is there a particular Australian flavor um, and Zach flavor to that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, sorry, the the um, water needs first. Yeah, cheers. I'll, I'll go with you. Yeah. Um, so um, I do a lot of work in the sustainable development goals. And, um, I am lucky enough to be surrounded by um, amazing people, including one of the people that was a fundamental part of writing them. So um, wow. I think we know now the direction. And I think the UN have done an amazing job of saying directionally, work on these 17 things <laughs> and the world will be better or not fall apart. Um, and um, I think what's amazing is more and more people talking about tri triple bottom lines, quadruple bottom lines, um, ways of seeing um, the commercial model in isolation is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have a responsibility to, to land to people, to all these different things. Mm -hmm. um, so um, one of the challenges in Australia right now um, that I am observing is um, making this uh, more than just good time metrics. Um, so um, we've, we've seen, um, if you had been in this country just after the global financial crisis, the, 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 there's such a different world from what I left in Scotland. So Scotland, parts of Scotland, we had over 70% unemployment. And then what? I came to, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't um, know that. That's shocking. Yeah, and my job in financial services at that time, um, I was dealing with suicides every week. So people holding um, their job title as their identity and when that identity was challenged believing that there was nothing worth living after that so so I came from that and then I got to Australia and they're like what global financial crisis let us tell you how rich we are <laughs> um, and especially like you spend time in WA and um, the the oil and gas industry it's phenomenally big yeah <laughs> um, um, it has kept them running, um, but we're at a crisis point that this is not serving us, right? Mm. And how might you uh, do some trade-offs, again, back to strategy of sacrifice, right? And it's really freaking hard to trade off the commercials for other things. And as, we're, um, as there's lots of indicators about um, recession, um, and interest rates going through the roof and oil and gas prices going through the roof. Um, it's really hard to keep um, sustainable development goals or um, ESGs or whatever label you call it in your company right, totally. um, embedded in what you do and not just default back to the commercial way of thinking and being because that is such a well embedded path. So um, just now it's how might we continue to drive these agendas even when it's hard, right? And, um, and I think what's really, there's so many people on this land that have been doing this for a lot longer and decades of campaigning in this space. Um, and it's been heard a bit but not quite at the tipping point that it needs to be to be able to catalyze the impact. It's yeah. And it's true. I mean, we're seeing the same thing in the U S and related to that is like, there's even just a question of like the normal transfer transformation playbook that you can use in good times, which have been for, you know, for the last decade or so. And now yeah. when you're in a recession, you know, forget even the other commercial models, which is true. People are like, you know, we talk to CIOs all the time. It's like, what's my, what's my reduction transformation playbook, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. I think we could have another hour long conversation on that last challenge, which we probably should do sometime, but I do want to move us forward to um, our rapid fire round, if you're ready. Yeah, of course. What is one thing that you do to be ready for a big meeting? Um, the 
I've had amazing training um, through a theatre company and um, they build on uh, the work around your um, to to get your head in the game and to to sit in a power pose to, which lowers the cortisol and in addition to that what they do is they talk to you about how to put um, a crown on how to put your cape on and how to put a light at your chest so that your posture um, and your power is sitting really um, well. So I think there's physical actions you can do if it's a really important meeting to remind the chemicals in your brain that you're here and you've got it. So cool, so specific. I hope everyone embodies those things because it's such such good tips. Okay, what is one, um, a, what a favorite way to spend a free day? Do you get any though with all of the things on your list? You get free days? Okay. Yeah, um, so I work four days a week. I'm trying to um, design the portfolio career that I want and that I, I know is coming for so many people. So I purposely, um, even though it's so hard, um, um, only ever work three or four days a week at a job. Um, um, so when I'm not there, um, one of the things, Melbourne is the most locked down city during COVID. Um, um, and I found because I wasn't with people, I wasn't getting my recharge and creative energies that I usually get when I um, spend a lot of time with designers. So um, floristry is my thing. So connection to flowers. And if you look at flowers in Australia, they're crazy amazing. The you guys have some. I was putting them in my wedding bouquet. I was like, I can't remember the name. They're like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, the the diversity of flowers here. Um, and just um, there's some beautiful Japanese practices that make you really focus on um, how the how one flower can be enough and oh yeah that's my that's my recharge that sounds really fun i'm kind of inspired yeah. now <laughs> all right do you have a famous catalyst dead or alive and why is that person your favorite yeah so um i've written down her name so that i can hopefully get um the uh full name right but dr miriam rose ungamer baumun and I'm sorry for my my pronunciation. We'll put but, it in the show links. You'll send us a link so yeah, we can yeah, send yeah, it there. Yeah. Um, so um, again, lockdown, um, mental health issues, um, the anxiety and the lack of control of the situation. Um, Dr. Miriam Rose um, has um, talked a lot. She's done so many things, but um, one of the things that really helped me was this concept of diddiri. Um, so it's a Northern Territory um, Indigenous word. Um, so there's um, there's uh, hundreds of different language groups in Australia. So um, it's not Indigenous one language; it's hundreds. Um, but uh, the the language that she brings is it's a word, it's a concept, it's a spiritual practice, and it's all based on respect. But it really translates to in English terms deep listening. Um, mm. but it's the ability to um, so um, just along from me is a place called the Yarra River and um, in the there's five different language groups around here and what the Yarra River used to be a meeting place for these five different language groups and if you um, think about it um, how often do you get together with people that speak a different language mm. and so they used to come together as a meeting place and give each other warnings and signals and be able to um, draw pictures about where the hazards were and where the food was and they mm. used to be able to communicate past language That's right nice. um, and the thing that it reminds me of so the Yarra River um, when uh, the British came here um, they asked what was it called and um, the local people said, Yara Yara, it runs fast. And actually the name of the place is Birarang Mar. And so I think for me, um, Dr. Miriam Rose's words around deep listening talks to me about not, not just listening to the first thing you hear as well, mm. making sure you hear the, the context and what's below it. And I'm surrounded by so much indigenous wisdom here 
that can hear on multiple horizons, that can hear on multiple levels, and that can think in ecosystems in a way that just blows my mind. Um, so um, my job is just to listen harder. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. And I can't wait to look her up. That's, she sounds amazing. All right, do you have a final call to action for our listeners? Yeah, I, um, there's been uh, an amazing um, doctor that's been looking at um, uh, transformation of people here. And what he's been able to identify is um, girls and boys need different things in their teenage years. Um, to be able to be the most successful. So I'm going to make this specifically about girls right now. Okay. Um, and he's found that when girls show up at hospitals, um, because he's a doctor, when girls show up at hospitals, it's um, often they've listened to other people rather than themselves. And their instinct has told them that this wasn't the right thing to do but they're, the external factors have pushed them um, to do something else. So um, I think today um, my call to action is, have you listened to your instinct recently? Are you able to hear what your instinct is telling you? And again, going back to your values and purpose, um, there's an amazing thing about um, your identity ladder. Um, your job title is not enough. Your purpose and values are the, the only things that will help you on your own transformation. So how can you um, get back to listening to what they are and doing the work to figure out what they are? Such an amazing call to action. So important. And we get so deprogrammed from being able to even hear our instinct sometimes. Like you talked earlier about the unlearning, right? Yeah. And how important that is and how we have that wisdom often inside of us. Thank you for that. Thank you for a great conversation, Helen. I look forward to our next one. And to our audience, thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about how to accelerate positive change, go to our website at catalystconstellations.com. Also, of course, be sure to check out the book, Move Fast, Break, Shit, Burn Out. And if you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send a link their way. Thanks again, Helen.